Are you a real estate investor that's got a couple properties and feels like you can no longer scale because your debt to income ratio won't support it? Have you been told by loan officers that you can't get any more properties because you have too many? Are you a small business owner who reports their taxes as self-employed and you've had a hard time getting financing for real estate? Or have you just never even bothered getting pre-approved because you've been told that you can't with the way you make your income? Well, in today's episode, Christian Bowser and I are going to tackle creative loan options that are still stable, reasonable, and sound for those that don't qualify based on W-2 income. You're going to learn a lot. You're not going to want to miss this episode. So buckle your seatbelt and get ready for a great show. But before we get into that, David, are you ready to multiply your real estate investments or snag your first deal? Discover why Deal Machine is the top choice for both novice and seasoned investors eager to land more off-market deals. Imagine seamless access to accurate owner contact info for free, powered by the same data that supports 90% of US caller ID, boosting efficiency and reducing search time. Forget outdated skip tracing methods. Instantly find contact info for property owners, hassle-free. Plus, with Deal Machine's new private investigator tool, you can track down even the trickiest leads, including corporate owners. Streamline your deal finding process and start your free Deal Machine trial today. Go to dealmachine.com slash BP YouTube as in Bigger Pockets YouTube. And now back to Mortgage Mondays. Christian Bachelor, welcome to Mortgage Monday, the show where fun meets finance. How are you today? Fun and finance. We got alliteration on Mortgage Mondays. Who would have guessed? All right. We're going to be talking about what to do when your DTI is out of whack. DTI stands for debt to income ratio. This is a metric that lenders use when they're looking to determine how much you are eligible to qualify for. The more income that you make, the less debt you have, the more you can borrow. So first off, let's talk about conventional loans and what a typical DTI would be for your average run-of-the-mill borrower. The normal allowance for your debt to income ratio, depending on the program for conventional loans will typically range between the 45 to 50% mark. Now, this is funny. We had this on a previous episode and a lot of people in the comments said, Fannie Mae says like a 26 to 38% ratio. It's funny when I study to get my mortgage license, you guys are right. That's technically what the textbooks say, but the maximum that it will still approve the loan for goes up to 45 to 50%, regardless of what your study exams say when you become an LO, anybody who's actually practicing knows you can go up to, based on your gross income, a 45 to 50%, depending on the loan product. Believe it or not, FHA even allows to go higher than 50, sometimes 55 or 57. FHA even higher. It gets really forgivable in FHA. But all of the loan products are going to start capping you the moment you reach about half of what you make from a gross perspective. Now let's put this into layman's terms. What is this 45 to 50% of? So let's say you make a stable base salary, let's just say 10 grand a month for an even number, right? It's $120,000 a year. That means on your qualifying, I can use, let's say 50% of that is 5,000 a month. All of your debts, that's your car payments, your mortgage, your credit card payments, your student loans, all of the debts that populate on your credit report that I see as a mortgage broker when I pull your credit can add up to $5,000 a month. That includes the mortgage that we're qualifying you for. So let's say, for instance, you have $2,000 outstanding right now. That's your car payment, your credit cards, your student loans. That means I can pre-approve you. And for those who just hear that word and don't actually know what goes into it, I can pre-approve you for a $3,000 mortgage. That's the difference to get you to 5,000 total liabilities. And I would do some backwards engineering to calculate how big of a mortgage based on the current environment of interest rates does a $3,000 mortgage get you in terms of a purchase price. And that's the number that goes on your pre-approval that you get from your lender before you go and shop for properties. Okay, so a lender is going to take all of the accumulated debt that you have added up, then they're going to add in what they believe the mortgage would be to get you to a point where that is about 50% of the total money that you make. Is that correct? That's correct. And most brokerages like ours, we don't go exactly to 50% because like a dollar can push you over. Usually there's some wiggle room. So usually we'll go to like 43, 44% so that you can still go a little bit over or taxes can come a little bit higher or insurance can come a little bit higher. Like if you're in Florida where we have some wiggle room where you're not absolutely to your cap, but that purchase price would allow you some flexibility so that you could potentially add on, you know, maybe you charge, you know, for your new furniture on a credit card and that happens before closing. We need enough wiggle room to be able to, uh, you know, accommodate new debt that could potentially happen happen during the transaction. All right. And this is why higher interest rates make homes less affordable because the higher your rate is, the more your payment is. So the less that you can borrow to hit that same DTI, correct? 
That's exactly right. Obviously, the larger the interest rate, the larger your monthly payment leads to you using more of your debt to accommodate for your new mortgage, which would theoretically drop your purchase price if you're up against your cap, right? So if you qualified for $500,000 at 3% interest, I remember we did an episode way back when, David, of how the purchase price changes with the interest rate. 500000 at 3% interest is probably going to be you know, 300000 at 7% interest, right? It does impact your purchasing power quite a lot when we're in that high interest rate environment. Great point. And that was a great show. We'll see if we can link to that in the show notes. You guys can go and listen to how much interest rates actually do affect how much you're able to borrow and your purchase price. Now, some people have DTI issues. Either they have too much debt, not enough income, or some combination of the two so that they can't borrow as much as they want. One solution you can take is the long road. This means lowering your debt by paying debts off and increasing your income by focusing on offense. This is all in my book, Pillars of Wealth, where I talk about strategies to do that. But there's also some creative solutions that you can use in the meantime. So let's talk about some of the loan products that are more favorable for people that are having a DTI squeeze, so to speak. And to clarify it exactly, a DTI squeeze can happen. We're not just talking about people who legitimately don't make enough money to qualify. Like I never want to advise somebody to get a property that like they don't actually have an ability to repay. It's not 2008. We're not trying to do subprime loans. This is not that episode. What this is for is the majority of the listener base of bigger pockets either is or has the desire to become an entrepreneur, a business owner, a real estate investor. And once you start diving down those areas of generation of income, you typically land in realms where what you make in reality, it does not have a one-to-one ratio with what you can qualify with, right? I have this kind of motto that I say in lending is not every dollar earned is the same. A dollar earned from like a W-2 job where you have an offer letter and a guaranteed salary, like a base salary that like in my $10,000 a month example, that's very determinable, right? I know what you make, it's not changing. You get the same W-2. Your pay stubs verify that every month. It's always equal. If you do something like what David and I do, it's very uncertain. We could have a month that we don't close any deals, literally big fat donut on our income report. We could have a month where we close 50 deals and it's a very large number. With lenders though, they care about the continuous or the sustainability of that income. How likely is it to continue? So if you're a business owner, those numbers have a much different way that they're calculated. We do things like average what's on your tax returns for the last two years because you don't have a pay stub. You don't have a guaranteed source of income. So when you start pursuing those routes of income generation, business owner, real estate investor, entrepreneur, real estate agent, loan officer, insurance agent, right? Commission-based roles. To answer your question, David, this is a long-winded answer. You start to get into a realm where you have to pursue alternative forms of finance because you don't fit in that rigidly defined box that conventional lending forces you into. Rounding this out with the actual answers to your questions, David, I think of things like loans for self-employed people who make money in terms of cash flow into their bank account, but it doesn't necessarily end up on their tax returns because they take a lot of deductions. Bank statement loans are very good for them. That's where instead of qualifying what's on your last two years of tax returns, you qualify with maybe 12 months average deposits into your bank account. That's what we use for your income calculation. If you're not a business owner and you're a real estate investor, many of our listeners are probably familiar with the DSCR product. That stands for debt service coverage ratio. That's where instead of you qualifying, the property does. So you kind of substitute who the qualifier is. We want to make sure that you buy a cash flowing property. And for ultimately like not so much first time home buyers, but people who maybe you're just trying to push the threshold a little bit of what they qualify for in that conforming realm, switching over from a conventional loan where you may be capped at that 45% threshold over to an FHA product that allows you to go up to 55. Maybe that 10% ratio difference in your qualifying could be a reason to switch to an FHA loan and qualify for that house price where you wouldn't have qualified conventionally. If you're talking to a broker, if you're talking to a loan officer, it is incredibly important that they're not one loan wonders that they don't just do one thing because you may be missing a lot of opportunity. David, we've used the example of you so many times. We've gone and submitted a loan for you for a specific property where in the middle of an escrow, I'll I'll realize, oh, this is a bridge loan scenario or this is a DSCR loan scenario or even this is a conventional loan scenario. And because any lender who does multiple loans, they can help guide you to the loan product that is the best fit not only for the best terms and the best rates, but the one you most likely qualify for. And they have to offer all of those to be able to make that guided decision. 
So let's go over some of the actual loan products that there are. So let's spit off some of the ways that you recommend people apply for specific loans if they're having DTI problems. So first one, conventional realm. If you want to stay in that realm, you switch to an FHA or if you're a veteran, a VA. That allows you to go a little bit higher on your threshold. If you stop qualifying in that realm, but you still want to qualify with your income and you're, like I said, a business owner, I would go to a bank statement program. That's where you qualify with the income on your bank statements instead of on your tax returns. If you still don't qualify there and you want to instead for you qualifying, have the property qualify, I would go to a DSCR loan. That's where you need a cash flowing property. If you still don't get that, you can go to a bridge loan. A bridge loan helps you qualify based on the value of the asset. So that's where like you're wanting to do some renovation or some value add, maybe a fix and flip or a burr. Bridge loans are perfect qualifiers for that because they don't care about income. They don't care about the cash flow. They care about the value of the asset and what you're doing to improve the asset. That's kind of the normal chain that I take people through because we do offer all of them and we can say, you don't qualify here. You don't qualify here. What's your goal for the property? Oh, bridge would be great for you, right? Like David, we've done a couple bridges for you this last month. They were perfect fits. You wouldn't have qualified conventional. The properties weren't lendable, but it allowed you to get a really good loan that finances the renovation that doesn't really care what you make for income. It cares about the value of the asset. So with all of these different creative financing options out there, are we looking at 2008 all over again with bad paper being given and another real estate recession en route? When you get into this realm of lending, this is a very, very common concern that maybe somebody who doesn't see what happens on the back end of these loans, it's a, it's a valid concern. I, I can totally understand why this would be the thought process because, you know, you start getting into, you know, what were called in 2008 ninja loans, no income, no job, NINJ, otherwise known as stated income loans. And the biggest difference at that time that I've really come to understand and why I have a lot of more confidence in the housing market this time around, even though our prices are, you know, amplified and interest rates are high, the qualifying metrics are still so high. The difference is in 2008, I could go into a bank and the loan officer would ask me, what do you make at your job? And I'd say $25,000 a month. And they say, oh, great. You qualify for a million dollar house. I say, cool. Can I get a pre-approval? They give it to me and I go buy a house. And they would fund based on what I state stated income. That's the whole reason it's called that. That not only was happening, that alone is bad. Of course, you don't want to give people loans based on information that is inaccurate. Nowadays, we fix that by actually verifying these things, right? Your bank statements. Do you actually generate cash flow? You know, they check to see if your bank statements are Photoshop. That's something that we don't talk about very much, but like some people have tried to Photoshop bank statements and give them to me. It doesn't work. You'll get caught. I promise. There's a lot of good tech that can check these things. But on top of just taking borrowers at their word, or sometimes even like dishonest loan officers were actually fraudulently submitting loan applications for people. They'd come in and say, I make five grand a month. And the loan officer would add a zero, 50,000 a month, <laughs> right? Because they wanted to make the commission. Not only was that happening, but it was amplified because those were mixed with 0% down loans. So not only were people qualifying for a loan amount that they shouldn't have, they also could get into real estate with zero money down. And combining those two is like the holy cow of like, what are we doing here? Whereas nowadays, all of these loan products, nothing I've discussed today, you can get with like a five or three or zero or 1% down payment. None of what I've discussed, right? Outside of the FHA loan. But FHA is very, very, very strict with income verification. Like they pull everything, right? But DSCR loans start at 20% down. Bank statement loans for primary start at 10. For investment start at 20 or 25. Bridge loans start at 25 or 30% down. Like you have to be into the property for a lot of value where if God forbid a 2008 happens, we have to have a 30% for most of these loan products, 20 to 30% decrease in home values for you to be underwater. The problem in 2008 is we had a 5% adjustment and everybody's underwater. Then foreclosures and fire sales, then we went to 10% underwater. Then a lot of people were 15 and then 20. And then I think the total adjustment in the nation was like 28 to 34% down depending on markets in 2008, which was like the vast majority of the American public because everybody got it. I remember in 2007, my mom got a 0% down loan no income verification. And she like had income. She's a registered nurse, but she didn't put any money down to buy her house. And it's like, what are we doing here? You know, like a 1% de decrease in the housing market and you owe more on your mortgage than the house is worth, which is a really bad place to be in. My general answer is, is we're not recreating 2008. We're towing the line between making housing accessible to all different forms of income generation while still adhering to the most proven and good track record loan underwriting techniques that we can. It's a fine line to toe, but I think we're doing it successfully this time around because ultimately we did learn a lot 
from 2008 into how to not originate mortgages in America. Well, at the foundation, what you're telling me is the loans are still based on one of two metrics, the debt to income ratio of the borrower or the debt to income ratio of the asset. But it's still not just, I made a number up, I pulled it out of my butt, I gave it to a loan officer and they gave me a bunch of money. That's the difference. There's also not this adjustable rate mortgage game where you're getting approved for a property based on interest rates that are significantly lower than the par rate with the belief that you'll just refinance it later or you'll just sell it later with no long-term options in place. Now, the way that they get to those numbers of the DTI or like in this case, the DSCR ratios, those are a little bit more creative. They're not convincing conventional, but that doesn't mean that they're unsafe. And if we're just being honest, even when they do use underwriting standards like conventional lending, like, hey, nope, just your pure DTI, you have to have a W-2 job. If everybody loses their W-2 job, if you go into recession, that's no safer than anything else. Like, There's no way that you can actually foolproof an economy against people defaulting on their mortgages. If housing values go down, if people are not able to make their payments, it doesn't matter how you underwrote them, things change. We see this all the time. doesn't matter what your house appraises for. Two years later, if the housing market has gone down, that appraisal appraisal is worthless. It doesn't matter what it appraised for when you bought it. Just like you don't really care what it appraised for when you bought it. If it goes up, you're going to sell it for the higher number. You're going to sell it on the comps, not on the appraised value that you paid for it. But it is good to know that there are some of these creative methods for people that may have been thinking, I'll never be able to be a real estate investor because my W-2 doesn't pay enough. Or I have too many properties. My DTI is too high. I can't get any more. There are options. And if you listen to this episode and you learn something, let us know in the comments here on YouTube what you learned and what you didn't know, as well as any questions you think we didn't cover. We'll be sure to review those and cover them in a future episode. If you've got a minute, check out another video. If not, we will see you next week on Mortgage Monday.